Welcome back aboard, streamers. You are listening to the Blood Stream, and I am your host, Jason Gray, your guide to the weird and the feared. And it is Halloween, and no, I am not going to drop a bit from the the Nightmare Before Christmas. I struggled with the name there for a second. It is legitimately Halloween. As I am recording this, I want to get this episode recorded, edited, and posted as soon as possible, hopefully by the end of the day, so you actually have my legitimate planned Halloween episode on Halloween. How that whole plan is going to work out, I have no idea because that's a problem for a future Jason. In fact, just because I want everyone to enjoy this episode as soon as possible, I am going to be releasing it to the Patreon and the free feed more or less at the same time. And that way the Halloween episode for everyone isn't being posted November 5th or something like that. So I teased a bit that this week I had a movie I genuinely enjoyed. And the movie that caught my eye is a little-known found footage movie from 2017 or 18, one of those. And it's called The Witch Files. It's directed by Kyle Rankin and written by Larry Blameyer, which is a name most people will recognize from the movie The Lost Skeleton of Cadavera. But back to Witch Files. This movie follows a group of high school students who bond together while serving detention and end up forming a coven when they discover they have access to witchy powers. And since that's pretty much the exact same description that you'll find in any synopsis out there, I'm just gonna jump right into the trailer and then get into the plot. And I already know I'm going to be talking about this movie a lot more than the last few movies, because there's just a lot here going on. Funny what happens when you have a movie with an actual plot. That's just another treat for y'all. I know how to work a camera. You apparently don't. Claire is in the air. 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 What's up, ladies? Oh my god, that was awesome. Anyone else thinking what I'm thinking? She's already paid. She's already paid. She's already paid. We all have things that we want, right? And I'm not just talking about shopping anymore. First thing on my list is to fly. Can we really? <laughs> We're witches. Oh my god! I'm flying! <laughs> what would you call that? Because I might call that a witch's ward. My life is really good, but now... What is happening to us? I think the spells are somehow costing us our youth. I swear. I swear someone's watching me. Hello? Is anyone there? I'm scared. I don't even know who I can turn to. Watch your back, Claire. Can you understand? I will kill you. Girls everywhere, some free advice. Don't trust your friends. Oh, you might be thinking this movie sounds awfully familiar. But please, hold all your comments until the end. As with all good found footage movies, this starts with a warning that the footage is that the footage is the property of the main state police. Well, good found footage movies start with a description of where the footage comes from, not all good found footage movies are property of the main state police, specifically. Just to be clear. The movie opens up with Claire, who some people might recognize from either The Americans or more recently Manifest, and in fact she's one of the reasons this movie got on my radar, because I recognized her from both of those. But anyways, Claire is trying to film a report on detention and if it's an effective tool of punishment, and she gets permission to go in and interview several students who are currently serving detention. And if I'm being honest, this introduces the characters a whole lot better than I ever could. So right from the get-go, I'm just going to jump right into a clip. Okay, let's start with your name. People know me. Totally, but for posterity. Brooke Cabot. And what are you in detention for? You know how to work this thing? I do, yeah. The school paper got us a new camera, but not new tripods. Our school has a paper? 
Yeah, a paper and a weekly news show, too. I was in algebra, and Mr. Clark, since he's an old perv, asked me what I was doing this weekend. I said, your mom, and he got all frustrated. And would you say detention is worthwhile, rehabilitation-wise? It's a huge pain in my dick. We done, Spielsberg? You can state your name whenever you're ready. Uh, Mary Jane LaFont? Call me MJ. I was making out with someone in the hallway. Oh, anyone in particular? Yes. Or... Darren? My boyfriend of two years, thank you very much. He's in detention across the hall. That is what you should do a story about, how the people in this town are just as Puritan as they were when they murdered all of those witches. Oh, no, that's, that's actually never been proven. That okay, that's people. fine. Look, I'm just saying, why separate the boys from the girls? It is wicked sexist. Does detention work? Will you rethink your actions in the future? No, oh, he's my boyfriend. I'm gonna kiss him when I want to. But besides, we are going to get married soon and put this whole state in our rear view. Okay. Greta, here because I ditched AP Chem yesterday, and there's nothing redeeming about detention. Why'd you skip class? Commitments are more important to me than neutrons. We had a game against Westbrook last night, and I've got a fullback sweeper who's been having trouble with her flick. She was worried since we wouldn't have much of a warm-up given the drive to their field, so she asked if I could give her a one-on-one -on -one refresher. Can you say that in English? I'm the captain of the field hockey team. Those are hockey terms. Well, did we win against Westbrook? Miss McClaskey. No. Um, the rebel's yeah? an idiot. How much longer will this take? Um, I have permission for the principal to conduct these interviews. And that's why I'm allowing them. I, I asked you how long. Another 20 minutes? Make it five. OK. This shouldn't be a social call. I'm pretty much done. Unless you'd like to say something in the black hoodie? Sorry, I don't know your name. Don't bother. She's new and she doesn't talk to anybody. She just creeps around being all grim and premenstrual. I hear she worships Satan, too. Oh. Hi. I'm Jules. I'm a Leo. I think detention is a great way to meet people. <laughs> You're kidding, right? I'm also not new. I was born in Brunswick and just moved back. My family's been part of this town since, like, pre-Revolutionary War. What got you in detention? Nate Aldrich. Oh. Oh. I call him the groper. <laughs> He's been at it since like the third grade. Yeah, he tried to fill me up in physics, so I pushed him. Wait, are you the reason he's on crutches today? He's like over 200 pounds. How did you push him? I just believed I could. Are you a Scientologist? No. I get it. It's like that the secret type stuff. I've been telling my teammates all about the law of attraction and how it can help us score. Yeah, that's all not it either. You realize a girl like you comes along every year, right? Trying to be a witch in Brunswick is like wearing mouse ears at Disney. Ooh. <laughs> I'm not trying to be anything. Mission accomplished. Look, if you're not full of crap, why don't you put your superpowers to good use and get us out of here? Okay. <laughs> Flash read it in Spielsberg. Uh, Brooke might be one of my favorite characters in this movie just because she has zero fucks to give. We'll get into that more as the movie goes along. I do like that because this is set at a school, it does give the filmmakers just a pinch more freedom on different angles because at random moments they can cut to security footage from various cameras placed around the school instead of trying to concoct some reason why someone has 20 different cameras sitting around their house. It's a great use of what would be technically available and it just gives the cinematography a little bit more life. And for an introduction scene, this is handled pretty well. One of the big problems in almost any movie is introducing your characters. We've all seen the scene where uh, they'll have the characters lined up introducing themselves in the most ham-fisted way possible. This is a tad clunky, but I think the movie just about gets away with it because the lead character is interviewing them and wants the characters to introduce themselves for the footage. But following that, Jules mutters a bit, does a little thing with her hand, and the fire alarm goes off, which causes the school to be emptied and getting everyone out of detention. The fire department shows up, and since they're going to be there for a while checking things over, the teacher in charge of things says, all right, everyone just go home. There's no point in you standing around outside until this is over with. Brooke accuses Jules of engineering this somehow with some non-existent friends because she's the new kid in school. And instead she explains that she used her magic powers fueled by the belief of the other girls in the room with her. The girls all seem interested in learning more about these magical powers, except for Brooke, who doesn't really believe any of this. Once they're all let go from the school, 
Jules says if they want to learn more, come find me at Merry Meeting Park at midnight. At dinner that night, we meet Claire's family, and they establish her sister has a stutter, and her dad is dissatisfied with his life choices and is also currently unemployed. He gives his girls advice to never let fear stand in the way of them trying something, so Claire, who had been kind of on the fence about whether or not to go to the park, uses her dad's advice as the impetus to get her out of the house. On the way, she runs into Brooke, who decided to check it out for curiosity's sake in the next clip. Benefit of having trusting parents? They never expect you to be irresponsible. Not that big of a deal. I'm 16. My peers are doing way worse things. Who's there? Ha! <laughs> what is wrong with you? Sorry, did I frighten you on your way to becoming a witch? I was just out, walking, very close to Mary Meeting Park. Well, I was curious if anyone would show. Well, let's be curious together. No, thanks. What's your deal, Miss Press? You live life through a camera? I report things. Perhaps you've heard of it? I remember you, by the way. Weren't you that girl in sixth grade who read our congressman and got, like, bulletproof vests for police dogs? Why would you remember that? Because I thought it was cool. I'm not a sandpaper tampon, you know. I don't know. We've never spoken. But I bet you've heard things. Oh, come on. Hearing rumors about me is one of my few joys. I heard you got a nose job the summer before freshman year. Best money my dad ever spent. Does he make a lot? Whatever he makes now, he spends on his new family. My mom got a pretty huge settlement, but she, like, pretty much drank the entire thing away, so. I'm sorry. You're not pouring Chardonnay down her throat. <laughs> well, either way, you're cool. Top of the local food chain. Why are you interested in this? Even if it's a big cauldron of BS, it'll make a good story. And if it's not, I'll be able to slap hexes on the people I hate. Ooh. <laughs> So it is happening. Yep. Right on. Is this or Netflix? I like that the movie isn't trying too hard to soften up Brooke's rich bitch character, but it does give her behavior a little more context and a little bit of depth, which is always a nice thing to do with these sorts of characters. They meet up with the other girls at the park. Jules draws a pentagram on the ground with some salt around Hag Rock, a supposed site where witches were murdered, uh couple hundred years ago. They also drop in a welcome little detail clarifying the difference between the use of pentagrams in Satanism and witchcraft, which is one of those things that most people at this point are aware of, but is still a welcome addition when I see it used in a movie. They do their little chant, bonding the group as a coven, thanks to some spells that had been in Jules' family for many generations. And then we play the waiting game in the next clip. How long should we give it? Doesn't say. Maybe it's dumb to wait. Maybe it's not that literal. Well, Claire, you said that the town didn't really burn witches here? From what I've read, yeah. It's well documented that these woods were used as a meeting place for pagan and Wiccan ritual practices, hence the term Merry Meeting Park. Did you just say hence? <laughs> and it's true that several women died here in the late 1600s, pre-Salem witch trials. But the diaries of the town pastor and local officials say that they were found dead at Hag's Rock. And history remembers them as witches, and they're probably just, like, outspoken women. Right? Like, they just mentioned to the men spoke a few things that could have been run better around town, and then what do you know, were later found decapitated. I always try to remember the one bright spot. Mary Perkins? She was found among the dead, cold and shivering with rope burns around her neck, but she was still alive. Really? I don't know about her. Well, did she ever say what happened? No, she was unable to speak because of the damage to her throat. So they jailed her for the murders. Later, she escaped and tried to blame the town. Said they tried to form a mob and tried to kill them. I'm with her. This town blows. <laughs> Holy crap. A, I like the fact that this is yet another movie that sets the record straight on burning witches in the, in the U.S. And two, comparing witches to outspoken women is another nice touch, since that is a common belief on how a lot of people think witchcraft accusations could possibly have gotten started back in the day. The girls follow the scream and discover the offerings they left buried in the ground have been taken. MJ starts freaking out, but Brooke reminds everyone they wanted something to happen. The girls eventually come back together at Brooke's house for the next spell to further bond the coven together, and once everyone arrives there, they perform the commencement chant, 
and now they're on their own because those are the only two spells that Jules had from her ancestor. They discuss what to do next and give their new witchy powers a try in the next clip. Was that it? Well, what'd you expect? A laser show? I don't know. I thought something would happen. Well, let's just try something, like a spell or whatever. But there were only two chants on the paper, right? Forget the paper. It's up to us now. I didn't use it when I did the fire alarm at school. Yeah, how did you do that? I just came up with a mantra about wanting it to happen, repeated it, and it centered me. So what'll be our first thing? Levitate this book. Levitate this book. Levitate this book. Okay, what are book. we doing wrong? Asking questions instead of concentrating? It could be a lot of things. Some doubt floating around, the way we're phrasing it. The book is already in the air. The book's 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 already in the air. MJ, come on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, this is freakish. I mean, that doesn't happen in real life, right? You wanted us to believe the book was already floating. That's smart. Right. There's no reason to doubt what we want because that's already happened. Okay, so we've already done the book. Claire is in the air. 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 Watch Claire the hands, Buster. Claire, what the? Claire is in the air. It's off, ladies. Claire is in the air. Looks like I hit the jackpot. Brooke, honey, you didn't tell me you were having a sleepover. It's a study group, Mom, and I did. Check your phone. Whatever, okay? Just keep it down here. We're gonna be upstairs. Whatever. Claire is in the air. Claire is in the air. Claire is in the air. Oh, Claire is in the air. Oh my God. Claire? Claire? Are you okay? Claire. Claire, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. I was trying to keep her up there myself. I'm unlucky. <laughs> Yes, I know, I know. This is indeed a riff on light as a feather, stiff as a board, which the craft already did. But I really, really like the shift of intentionality here. Making it into a chant of something they are trying to believe has already happened, or is happening at that moment, so it just is, is a really good way to set their form of magic apart from a lot of other movies. And... I just think it makes a lot of sense from a willpower and belief sort of standpoint. The next day, the girls are at a diner discussing what to do next when the waitress tries to usher them out, and they decide to try to use their powers to pay for the bill without paying for the bill. And thus, the problem with their spells becomes immediately evident. And they all realize it pretty quickly. The bill has not actually been paid, the waitress only believes it has thanks to the girls' mystical version of a diamond dash. The Coven is not without concerns over this, but they are a little busy being teenagers with too much power on their hands to really be too worried about it. In fact, they are so not bothered by this, they continued the magical mystery tour by going on a shopping spree downtown. They've all been doing little things up to this point, but Brooke realizes they could be doing so much more and says that this should be about improving their lives and not just skipping out on paying the tab. So everyone agrees to meet up later that night with lists to focus the sum totality of their psychic might. The movie kills a little time with small character moments, and Claire drops a fun little factoid in the next clip. Hold up, say that again? Not while you're recording. Claire just explained to me why witches ride brooms. A theory I read, that's all. They were drug addicts. <laughs> okay. There's this mold that grows on really old rye bread, and if you eat it, you hallucinate. But if you swallow too much, then you'll die. So to get the fun effects without the danger, you can let it seep through your bloodstream via another area. Oh, like your vagina? <laughs> <laughs> well, they may have wiped the mold on things like broom handles and rubbed it between their legs. Oh. 
Hence the reports of ladies in fields riding their brooms. Gross. I'd at least have the decency to do that indoors. And here we are again with the movie bringing Urgot into things. I love all the little details from various kinds of witchy lore that the movie are peppering it all throughout the story. While they keep talking, a homeless woman tries to grab Jules, but fortunately she uses her magic to push her away. Finally, we get the coven back together so they can discuss their list. MJ wants to guarantee her boyfriend will propose to her, as well as boobs. Greta wants a new car and wants her team to beat the big rival school in the next game. Brooke, on the other hand, goes big by wanting to have a pack of dogs attack her dad's new girlfriend, and for her mom to stop being a drunk. All Claire wants is for her dad to get a new job and to fix her sister's stutter. And as for what Jules wants, well, that's in the next clip. Jules, how about you? What do you want? First thing on my list is to fly. Whoa. Can we really? <laughs> We're witches. What's the second? At this year's spring fling, I want to be crowned flower queen. <laughs> What? It's never someone like me. It's always some stuck-up bulimic bitch. Um, it was me last year? <laughs> but you really think I could pass for bulimic? Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I just think it'd be cool for people on the fringes. That'd be a big spell, right? The entire school would have to think you're the best candidate. That doesn't feel right. It's like giving everyone a date rape drug. Whoa. Way to make it awkward. Yeah, who made you spell sheriff? No one. And we've proven that it doesn't take all of us to make stuff happen, so I, I can go. No, don't be like that. Well, there's just things that I think we shouldn't mess with, like hurting people or performing psychic surgery on our bodies. I at least propose that if anyone has any body image things on their list, we table them for now. So my entire list, basically. Aww. Really? All of us? <laughs> well, I'm supposed to meet Darren later, so I'd rather not sit around here chanting all night. All right. How about we limit this first session to two things each? Would that unknot your panties? It might. And I don't want the dog attack anymore. I thought of something better. I want Dwyer off my back. You know, Claire, I'm not asking for the whole school to love me. Just vote for me and put that stupid tiara on my head. It's up to you, Claire. Walk away or get that job for your dad. Oh, wait. Can I do the flying thing too? Sure. Yes. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> so they do the chanting, we see them fly, but the landing is a little bit more rough. MJ lands pretty badly and spits out a tooth. This girl is just not having a good week with her dental. They rush MJ to the hospital and that gets taken care of as best it can. And her boyfriend arrives revealing that he was indeed going to propose to her that night and the coven assumes they are all going to get what they wished for. That feels a bit premature since everyone's been commenting on how absolutely certain they all are that Darren is going to propose to MJ no matter what, wishing or not. Still, their wishes do indeed start coming through, and there is enough evidence beyond the proposal. Later on, Brooke, Claire, and Greta head to a party in the woods, and Claire catches the guy she's been interested in most of the movie up to this point, making out with Brooke. Also, Jules arrives after taking a flight to Boston, having figured out that things like branches and broomsticks help quite a bit with stability. The next day, Claire is talking over the betrayal with Jules, when consequences show up for their actions in the next clip. No, it was deliberate. She knew I was excited about Jason. The Great Depression I know. Was a How could she not? Market for the wealthy. Much of what they have today is because they snatched up farms and the homes and the labor of people who could not afford to pay their loans. Excuse me. Did you see her this morning? No, and I don't want to. There's nothing Brooke can say that's going to make this better. Claire? Sorry, we were just uh, talking. Claire, I need you and Jules to step out in the hall, please. Hi, girls. Uh, I'm sorry to pull you from class. I'm Detective Strauss. This is, is Officer... Is that recording? Yes, and it's going to stay that way. We're on public property, so I don't need to turn okay. it off. It's okay. It's about time I got on YouTube, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, you girls were shopping in the old port last Saturday. You left Courier with some new handbags and clothing. Would you happen to have the receipts? Is there a problem with them? Uh, security footage shows you just walking out, not paying. What about the cashier? He says you paid. Because we did. Cash or credit? 
credit. Cash. The drawer came up short. The owner's a friend of mine. <laughs> Let me get this straight. If you're tight with some local detective, you can have girls harassed because of a bookkeeping issue? See, now I'm surprised this is unpleasant. I thought you'd clear this up quickly. It's perfectly clear. We paid. Shoes continue to drop like their house is in Oz, as the teacher Brooke was having trouble with, that they magicked to be nicer, starts behaving too nice to an underage girl that's his student, causing him to lose his job for inappropriate behavior. Claire has also been having problems with her glasses throughout the movie up to this point, and we find out they're not screwed up prescriptions or anything like that, she has in fact developed macular degeneration. And while Greta is out on the field practicing, she has sharp knee pain that gets diagnosed as early onset arthritis, and Brooke is starting to get a little hard of hearing. Claire starts putting things together, and since all magic comes with a price, deduces that they are paying for the spells at the cost of their own youth. This is a really well done twist on the popular depiction of witches as crones by just making that a cost of using the magic. Claire urges her coven to stop using their powers, hoping things reverse or at least don't get any worse. But Brooke kinda likes having her mom back in her life again, and since Claire is just theorizing, says she has no plans to stop. Once Brooke leaves, Jules and Claire go to visit their other coven mates so they can be caught up on the plot. MJ, however, isn't taking visitors right now, and Greta is in rough shape with her arthritis. They sit down to have a chat, but that gets interrupted when the cops show up again in the next clip. You think she'll stop? I don't know. She walked out on us. I didn't need the things I wished for. My life was really good. But now... <laughs> Your dad got his job, right? And your sister stopped stuttering? Maybe the nice things you did will help reverse the effects. Do you think that could happen? Hello? Well, this is getting interesting. Can I help you? Oh, I'm Detective Strauss. Hello, Jules, Claire, and you must be Greta, right? Is that your BMW? No. No? Oh, didn't you drive that off the Lee Automotive lot? I, I, I don't remember. Um, the salesman there said you paid for it in one lump sum. Then why are you bothering her? Because there's no record of the transaction. Please, just take it back. You know, believe it or not, I've seen this kind of thing before. You found the car detective. Bravo, mystery solved. 17 years ago, a different group of girls at Brunswick High. Claire, we don't need to listen to this. I'll be in in a minute. <laughs> Fine. You know, I never could figure what those girls were into, but they collected a whole heap of things that didn't belong to them. It ended badly. Later, Claire is Skyping Jules and they're brainstorming what they can do about this situation, and she suggests chanting their powers away and for things to go back to the way they were. In the middle of the discussion, Jules gets attacked by the little cousin of the smoke monster from Lost and is smashed around her room. The next day, Claire visits her friend in the hospital, and Jules says she did her best fighting Smokey until it shoved her out the window. When she came to on the ground outside, she had a lock of blonde hair clutched in her hand. So it looks like Brooke is making sure the coven isn't working against her. Brooke shows up outside Claire's window to give her side of the story in the next clip. Hey, can we talk? Okay. You gonna let me in, or...? It's late. Here's fine. I can hardly hear you. Let's walk, at least. If anything happens to me, Brooke Cabot is responsible. May she who looks not see me when I say invisibility. May she who looks not see me when I say... I'm leaving behind the last chunk of footage I've shot. For evidence. Claire? That you? Yeah, just... setting the alarm. I now understand that saying cold is a witch's tit. Mine are about to snap off. That's what you wanted to talk about? The weather? So, where to? Lead the way. 
So, you mad about the Jason thing? Who? Oh, come on. Yeah, I thought it was lame. I also don't think it matters right now. Crazy what happened to Jules. She'll pull through. Should I be worried? That she'll pull through? No, that it had something to do with our coven. You tell me. Like I said, I'm losing my hearing. That sounded like you tell me. Look, Claire, I've always hated the way girls fight. All innuendo and shit. I'd rather things just come to blow so I know where I stand. Invisibility. <laughs> Clever. Thought we weren't doing magic anymore, Claire. Thought the price was too high. Here's a tip. If you're gonna disappear, drop the camera. <laughs> Invisibility. Damn it. Semi-permanent, like your dye job. Girls everywhere, some free advice. Don't trust your friends. So the pair had a low budget magic off in the middle of downtown, and eventually Brooke gets the drop on Claire by confusing her with a bunch of Brooke clones. Well, okay, they could really only afford two. That at least stops the fight long enough for them to compare notes and realize that both of them thought the other was responsible and that someone else is probably responsible for pitting them against each other. So they were only trying to protect themselves before becoming the next victim. Unfortunately, their magic battle leads to more bad side effects with Claire's hair starting to turn white and Brooke developing warts. They realize that all of the side effects that Jules was claiming she has were all internal and thus, and thus she couldn't really show them to the rest of the group. But we'll get back to that suspicion in a little bit. Before that, they meet up with Detective Strauss again. The cop tells them more about the previous group of girls that she encountered, and it's pretty clear if you haven't figured it out already that they were another coven. Two of the girls went missing, one that no one can find, and the other was a foster kid, so when she went missing, no one cared. The rest of that coven all died from ergot poisoning. Claire and Brooke ask the cop why she's so interested in all this, and we learn of another group of girls from 1983 that also had a lot of these same things happen to them. Oh, and one of the girls that went missing from that group happened to be Strauss's sister. Brooke and Claire both noticed that the pictures of one of the girls from the previous coven are all blurry, so they head back to the school to start digging through old school yearbooks with the help of Claire's sister to see if they can dig up any more information that way. And that, dear streamers, is when things start to get interesting in the next clip. Claire, that name you gave me, is that a joke? Why? Well, Abby Butcher is an old Brunswick name. So old that this list came up. Women found dead in Mary Meeting Park in 1689. That can't be. The name in the middle. Julia Sutton. Isn't that the same what as- what picture is that? It's a woodcut depicting the supposed rituals at Mary Meeting. Can you cross-reference that list with the students enrolled here? Holy crap. Look who was Flower Queen 17 years ago. Abby effing Butcher. Oh my gosh. Here she is again, 1966 using the name Susanna Martin. This is our oldest one from 1932. And here's a girl named Martha Carrier. Same name as one of the accused Brunswick witches. Similar features. I'm confused. What do these girls have in common? They might be the same person. They might even be a witch who's 300 plus years old. One who returns to Brunswick every 17 years and uses the names of her original victims as aliases. This is a show you've been binging, or this is real life? Man, how pathetic do you have to be if your entire life goal as a centuries-old witch is to relive your glory days by being crowned prom queen or, or whatever it was every 17 years, hanging out endlessly with teenagers? Anyways, Brooke notices a another page that is a dedication to the other girl that went missing, and Claire realizes it's the homeless person they keep running into throughout the movie. It's fairly easy for them to track Sarah down. Unfortunately, Sarah can't speak, since that was her cost for using the magic 17 years ago. But she does have a notepad, and we learn the whole coven thing is a lie. The coven bonding spells were nothing more than, than magic that bonded the girls together specifically with jewels, so she could drain their life force while doing all this magic. Sarah also reveals that if Jules is crowned Flower Queen, 
It will seal the spell and make things permanent, granting Jules 17 more years of youthful teenagery. Can you even imagine not being able to buy a drink without using a fake ID for something like 300 years? Before Sarah can give us any more useful information, she gets hit by a car that comes out of about as much nowhere as you get when you step out into the road in the middle of a horror movie, which causes the girls to run off before the cops show up. MJ wanders back into the movie by paying a visit to Jules in the hospital, telling her that Brooke and Claire have gone missing following their big magic fight the night before. But of course that's all a ruse as MJ calls Brooke to let her know that Jules thinks the other two have skipped town and won't be a problem for whatever's going down at the dance. So everyone heads to the dance ready to surprise Jules and hopefully stop her from getting crowned and sealing the spell. Greta points out the massive amount of danger in all this because hell hath no fury like a witch scorned. Unfortunately, while they do succeed in chanting away her getting the crown, this is not the only way that Jules can seal the spell, and Plan B involves a blood sacrifice by killing Jason. Wait, what? We get a little bit more low-budget display of power while the girls fight at the dance, but eventually Jules takes Jason and heads to Hag Rock to do her thing. MJ flies Claire to the park and has a little better handle on the landing this, and Claire runs off with no real plan in mind, to try and stop Jason from getting killed. Yeah, yeah, let's not have that happen. Claire finds them at the rock, and Strauss is not far behind. In the final clip. Come closer, Claire. Get a good angle. And what should I call you? Julia? Abby? Martha Carrier? None of those. Mary Perkins. And if an entire mob couldn't stop me, what makes you think you can? Whoever you are, please don't hurt him. He hasn't done anything. I'm afraid I must. See, it's either him or me. Drop it! <gasps> Be careful, detective! Drop the knife and back away. Leave now and I'll let you do so with your life. Such as it is. I'm not gonna ask again. Put your hands over your head. Look out! Ooh. Oh God. Victims, uh, victims of jewels across time and space. Help me now to wipe her off the face. Victims of jewels across time and space. Help me now to wipe her off the face. Victims of jewels across time and space. Help me now to wipe her off the face. Victims of jewels across time and space. Help us now to wipe her off the face. Victims of jewels across time and space. Help us now to wipe her off the face. Victims of jewels across time and space. Help us now to wipe her off the face. Victims of jewels across time and space. Help us now to wipe her off the face. Victims of jewels across time and space. Where are they going? They're going after her, I bet. Come on, let's wait. Where? We lost them? Shh, listen. <laughs> this way. <laughs> Leave me to my work now, Constable. There's nothing you can... You can't be here. You're not real. Nice try, Claire, but I've come up against smarter people than you. I'm sure, but all at once. And so, of course, Jules is the previously mentioned Mary Perkins, and I really like the idea of bringing back her past victims to do her in. It's such a good way to give them some sort of closure, and also lets them take back a little bit of their power and agency in almost literal sense. Also, it gives Detective Strauss a nice sense of closure by getting to see her sister one last time and know what actually happened to her. It's a clever bit that works within the rules that the movie has established and is handled fairly well. So Jules has had much of her power stripped away and been reduced to nothing but an old woman, but still has enough juice left in her to make an escape, leaving that door open. And the other girls agree to come down to the station later and make a statement. Oh, I just bet that is going to be some nightmare paperwork. Also, Strauss asks for the recordings, which is always a nice moment when found footage movies remember to actually close that loop. It's a really solid ending with the four very different girls 
who likely would never have been friends without the events of this movie, are now closer than ever. As they leave school, we see them being watched from another camera, and hear Jules chanting as the credits begin to roll. I really could have done with just having the slightly more definitive ending of having the girls walking, walking out of the school triumphant and end on that note. We already know Jules is out there, and just having her there at the very last moment chanting takes a tiny bit away from the victory of it all. So yes, as I mentioned before, this is indeed the craft with the serial numbers filed off. It is the found footage, low budget, CW wannabe equivalent of that definitely much better movie. But at the same time, it really does have enough of its own story to tell and its own unique vision that it's still pretty much its own kind of thing. And I'm going to be very frank here. I am very aware that I am probably going to be the only person that is going to say nice things about this movie. I've looked up other comments and they are not kind. And I'm not going to say this is a great movie. This is the next big hidden classic. But I'm not going to lie either. I had a really fun time with this. And I just thought it was a unique use of found footage. I thought it was a different enough version of the high school coven craft type story that has been done before, has been done better, but they have their own unique voice, and I just had fun with it, okay? This movie very easily could have gone the simple route of, yet again, just having the evil witch of the coven be someone who is, who is turned bad by the corruption of power, and it would have been fine. It would have been even more like The Craft, but it would have been a lesser movie. Doing its own unique thing and tying it to a longer legacy and conspiracy, for lack of a better term, really does elevate this. It's that and all the little touches of weaving in witch and witchcraft lore that really make this stand out from other craft knockoffs that are out there. If you ask me should you watch this or The Craft, I'm gonna say The Craft 9 times out of 10. But that one time, that one time you just want something different and you don't want to watch The Craft again, like I say all the time, there are a lot worse movies than this. This is well made, well shot, I think the acting is pretty decent. This movie is not going to blow your socks off on any level, but it's still just enough above average that you can have a good time here. So that is going to wrap it up for this week. If you have enjoyed listening to this, you can find all our past episodes pretty much wherever podcasts can be found. Just search for The Blood Stream. We are the one that is not a medical podcast. If you have questions, comments, concerns, or would like to recommend a movie for me to check out, you can contact me at thebloodstreampodcast at gmail.com. If you would like to support my poor life decisions, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash thebloodstream, where for just $2 a month, you can get early access to episodes and whatever bonus content I put out. So once again, thank you for listening. That was The Witch Files, this has been The Bloodstream, I have been Jason Gray, and remember, if you're gonna disappear, drop the camera. It's over. We won. Roll credits.